If you have your Bibles, if you turn over to Luke chapter 18, it'll be Luke chapter 18, and we're actually, while you're returning there, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 18, verses 35, all the way through chapter 19, verse 10, and a very familiar story, and we're going to be looking at two different stories, and we'll be tying them together. These are two stories of two men, both in the same city, which is Jericho, two different walks of life, one a blind beggar and the other a short, rich IRS agent or tax collector. But both men totally different, but yet they had the same need. And we're going to take the next few minutes and look at the opportunity, the choice, and the change that took place in these men's lives. Now, Zach, the story of Zacchaeus, we know that it's, it's only in uh, the book of Luke. The story of Bartimaeus is, 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 is in three different sections of the Gospels, one in Matthew, one in Mark, and Luke and John. I'm sorry, not John, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But uh, Luke, on uh, Mark, uh, book in Mark, is the only one that mentions him by name, Bartimaeus. But I chose to look at uh, chat in the, the, the story in Luke simply because it has both stories of blind Bartimaeus and the uh, story of Zacchaeus right there on the same page together. So we'll kind of look at these two. But first, the opportunity. You know, a long time ago, a bounty of $5,000 was offered for, for each wolf captured alive. Two friends, Sam and Jed, they both saw their chance of making a fortune. Day and night, they scoured the mountains and forests looking for their valuable prey. Exhausted one night, they fell asleep dreaming of their potential fortune. Suddenly, Sam awoke to see that they were surrounded by about 50 wolves with flaming eyes and sharp teeth. Sam nudged his friend and said, Jed, wake up. We're rich. An opportunity, you see, an opportunity is defined <clears throat> as a favorable occasion when we have the option of making a decision that could have a positive impact. We all have opportunities, that, um, you know, some, and you know, maybe it's a job opportunity, different opportunities that we have, if we go and we accept, it could go and we can go and, and, uh, and help us, has a positive impact. But you see these two, they, these two men, Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus, both had, uh, both, both had the opportunity. You see that both men are around the city of Jericho. Maybe there was a chance that while Zacchaeus was out tax, getting his taxes, collecting his taxes, he had ran along, he had ran into maybe perhaps uh, Bartimaeus. But look in verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 35. We're going to take a, a brief look at the two men. In chapter 18, verse 35, it says, And it came to pass that he was come nigh to Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. Now, if you skip right over to the next chapter, chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, it says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. So we see him, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, I'm sure, clothes dirty, because he was sitting on the ground, he was hungry. And here's, and here's Zacchaeus, a rich man who was chief among the publicans. He lived in a nice house that said he was rich. He was probably sporting the latest fashion in sandals and clothes. But it's so different, but yet they still had the same opportunity. They both had already heard of Jesus. They had heard about his miracles and about his teachings. Bartimaeus knew that this, this, this was his opportunity to receive sight. Zacchaeus knew that this was his opportunity to see a man that could meet his needs and give him peace that money couldn't buy. So, not only their opportunity, they had, they had to make a choice. A choice had to be made. They did not only worry about what others thought about them, they didn't let the crowd stop them. In verse 36 through 39 of chapter 18, it says, And hearing the multitude pass by, they asked for his, I'm sorry, let me start over here. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passes by. And he crowd saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they that which went before rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. 
Barsmatis yelled out. The crowd tried to hush him, but he yelled out even louder. I don't know how many of you ever tried to go and try to hush somebody who was making a, maybe making a noise. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe being a teacher, you tried to hush down the uh, the classroom. When you try to go and when you try to go and hush someone to get someone to calm down, I know as a I had to be for as about a young teenager. We were over at my grandparents' house, family uh, family reunion every Fourth of July. And we had gone down there, and me and my cousin Dan, we were all out there playing around. It's time to go and eat. And my grandparents had a big, I'm from Dallas, we didn't have these things, but out there in the country, they had these big propane, silver propane tanks out there in the yard. And so he went, and they had, my grandmother had a metal clothesline going across. They had a little, the metal, uh, had a metal clothesline going across that she hung clothes out on. And so it was gone, it was time to go, and the food was ready, it was time to go and pray, and so we went over there to go and, and, and pray, and my, my cousin Dan, he ran, he jumped up there on that, on that propane tank. And he, we, as, we, as we started to pray, we were closing our eyes, I was standing next to it, I just hear, uh, and I thought my, my cousin was sitting there playing around, we were always joking, so I kind of turned to him and said, hey, shh, you know, hush, we're praying. Now he got, he got louder, uh, and when he had done, he had grabbed hold of that of the cloak metal clothesline going across. The next thing you know, I see my, I'm, I'm trying to bow my head, and I'm trying to tell him, I'm telling him, hey, shut up, you know, wait, be quiet. We're trying to, we're trying to pray. You're, you're embarrassing me. The next thing I know, here's my aunt Rosie. She comes. She does a great imitation of a linebacker. She goes, she dies, knocks him off of the propane tank, and somehow there was, I don't know how it was, a short or something. Somehow, when he was sitting on that propane tank, and he was on that sitting on the metal, and he was touching that metal line, he was getting shocked. And I'm sitting there telling him, hey, be quiet, you're embarrassing me. You know, come on now. And even my uncle, whenever he's like, there's no way that could shock you. He went over there and touched the, the propane tank, touched the wire, and sure enough, it shocked him as well. You know, these uncles have to be, as far as have to prove. But, you know, I kind of, I kind of afterwards, of course, felt kind of bad. Here he is, I'm sitting there telling him again, telling him to be quiet while he's getting, getting shocked and everything. But I can imagine the crowd, Bartimaeus, here's his chance. Here's his chance to go and to finally go and maybe to receive sight. So he hears that Jesus came, is just coming by. He hears that, he knows that this is his chance. He goes and he cries out to Jesus, thou son of David. And the crowd's sitting there, you know, hey, be quiet. You know, we want to see Jesus. We don't want to hear you yelling. And it says he even goes and cries out, to, he cries out even louder. He cries out even the more. And, you know, <clears throat> I go and I picture it. I'm sure that wasn't far as, like we have a parade, everybody lying on the street, here's Jesus and the disciples walking down the middle of the street. Middle of the street. It's all where, you know, it's kind of everybody in there together. They're, they're, they're going, he's, Jesus is walking down with his disciples, and everybody's kind of pressing up. And not only did Bartimaeus, he knew this was his chance. Also, as far as in uh, chapter 19, verses 3 and 4, it says, And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was of little, little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up to the sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Because the crowd and Zacchaeus couldn't see, he climbed up in the sycamore tree. This was hardly a dignified thing for one of the wealthiest, most prominent men of Jericho to do. They both had an opportunity. They both did whatever was needed to be done to see Jesus. We also know from both stories that Jesus stopped to talk to them. Jesus heard Bartimaeus' voice over the whole crowd. I'm sure the whole crowd, as Jesus is coming down the street, I'm sure everybody's not sitting there, shh, let's be quiet. Jesus is coming. Let's be quiet. No, I'm sure there's, hey, Jesus, you know, they're just, just going in there. Maybe they're praising Jesus. Maybe they're, they're calling out to him. And Jesus goes and hears his voice over the crowd. Jesus saw Zacchaeus, as they said, because he couldn't get to him because of the press of the people. And Jesus knew to look up and see, and see the tree, and for, and see, see uh, that kiss up in the tree. Jesus, he knew about their needs. Bartimaeus was blind physically and spiritually. I'm going to turn over to 2 Corinthians real fast, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 6. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 6. <clears throat> I always love this passage of scripture. It says in verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. 
in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus knew that Bartimaeus, he was also, even though he was physically blind, he was also spiritually blind. You know, that's, this passage of Scripture here is telling us, whoever is not saved, who have never, any of us who have never accepted Christ as their Savior, we're also spiritually blind. We go from, and when we go and we accept Christ as Savior, we go from being uh, blind to having a light. And we have to go and we have to ask ourselves, how bright is our light? You all know the song for us? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to sing it to you, but sing it for you all, but for just say the words. But it's my little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Uh, you know, they didn't have that part, you know, I'm going to hide it under a bushel. No, you know, I'm going to let it shine. This, this, we get the song for this verse. And so many times as Christians, we have a light. When we're going, we, if we've accepted Christ as our Savior, we're no, more, we're no more in darkness. We have a light, we are a light. And God for us wants us to, our light to be, to be bright, not hid. And so Jesus knew about their needs. He knew that, as I said a while ago, Bartimaeus was blind, physically and spiritually blind. Zacchaeus, was a, he was a, an honest, for a dishonest man. He needed Christ. And Jesus knew they both needed salvation. But we also see that they both came to Jesus as they were. You know, as far as this, in, remember the story of Joseph, Whenever he was in prison and he had to go and he, had a, he was going to be brought before Pharaoh to um, interpret the dream, his dreams, that he had to go and he had to go shave, he had to go take a bath, he had to go and put new clothes on just in order to go and see the Pharaoh. But not with God. God says a sinner comes to God just as he is or she is. With all their sins, burdens, guilt, bring it all to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 11, we're going to read this, this, this verse real quick. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, it says, Come unto me, <clears throat> excuse me, come unto me, all ye that labor. I'm going to give me some water here. <clears throat> I'm going to dip into my lunch real fast. Uh, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. <clears throat> and that's what God wants. We don't have to do. You know, I talked to people before where they would go and be witnessing, whether it was in jail or whether it was just out witnessing. They're saying, you know what, I know I need Jesus. I know I need to turn to Jesus, but I need to get a few things straight first. Let me go and let me get some things straight, and then I'll turn to Jesus. You, you go and you go to Jesus. You get Jesus, and then you go and you straighten out. And you know, it's great to know that Jesus, he's going to take us as we are. And they came to Jesus, and it was their choice. If they went and they got Bartimaeus and they led, started leading him to Jesus, Bartimaeus could have changed his mind. After, you know, for his uh, Zacchaeus was up in the tree, Jesus said, hey, come down to me. Zacchaeus could have said, you know what, you know, I just wanted to see you. I don't really want to go to your house because Jesus said, hey, come, come, come down, we'll go to your house. Zacchaeus said, you know what, I just wanted to see you. I don't, I don't want, actually want you to come to my house. But, no, it says that, it says that he went with joy. They had, to, they had to make a choice. So in verse 40 through 42 of uh, chapter eight, Luke chapter 18, 40 through 42, it says, And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith, has saved thee. We also go, as Bartimaeus received the sight, also in chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. I just got to mention, it says that when Jesus came to the place and looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Bart received more than just his sight. We know as far as on verse 43, it says, And immediately he received the sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people when they saw it and gave praise unto God. We know that in verse, 
that Zacchaeus, in verse 8 and 9, it says, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore unto him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much is he also the son of Abraham. Now we know for us here these two stories, two men, same vicinity, city of Jericho. They both had the same needs. They both had the same opportunities. They made, they made the same choices, and they, first, and they, were, they were both were saved. Now, fast forward a couple of thousand years ago. If you're here a child, if you're today here and you're a child of God, there's been a time that you knew you can't get to heaven on your own, and you went and you asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be your Savior. You've had the same opportunity. You've had to make the same choice, and, 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 and that God changed your life, just like Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus did. But we still in our day-to-day lives have opportunities to do something for God. It's a choice we must make daily. Choices that we, I mean, there's, we make choices every day. From minute little things, from what I'm going to wear, what I'm going to eat, to some big, to, to big choices. But here today, I just want to just ask you, tell you, Going and realizing that you can't get to heaven on your own, realizing you can't work your way to heaven, realizing you can't go and buy your way into heaven, realizing that, and realizing the only way you can go to heaven is through Jesus Christ. That's the greatest choice you ever make in your lives. And you know, but then it's not, it doesn't stop there. But if we're not careful, we let opportunities pass us by, maybe failing to recognize that God has sent them. I mean, I can never. There's numerous times that I've had opportunities. Maybe I felt the Holy Spirit, you know, give me a little nudge. Hey, you need to go witness to them. You need to go talk to them. Or maybe there's different things. You need to go and do this for God or that for God. And I go and I kind of, no, maybe later I'll kind of put it off and putting it off. And I go and I miss opportunities. And I probably, if each and every one was honest, we probably said, you know, there's been opportunities that I've probably missed for God as well. And that's something as far as just, just a thing. As Christians, we have to go and we have to try to go and to daily seek the Lord. Daily try to go and do whatever it is that we can go and we can make the best, avail- you know, best opportunities to witness. Also to serve. I mean, at this church, we got plenty of places to serve. I mean, we got Sunday school, we got children's church, we got choir. If I can sing in the choir, anybody can sing in the choir. Just ask those ones around me. You got... You got, you got VBS coming up. We still need, and you, a lot. Some people think, you know what? I don't know if I could go and I could work with. If I want to work with kids, you know, you know, we got a lot of people around us. We're all a support group, you know. Afterwards, we kind of hold together and pray for each other, you know. But no, but we go and we're we have opportunities to serve. Whether it's doing something in first, like say, Sunday school, or whether it's something to do here in church, whether it's just being as far as a prayer warrior. Let me tell you, that's a huge service right there, being a prayer warrior. Just, there's no way this church is going to be able to, get, to go on without the prayers of people. There's no way the pastor is going to be able to do what he needs to do without the prayers of people behind him. And we were just talking to Miss Ida this, this week, visiting her in the nursing home, and, and, she was, and she was going, she was talking about all the different people. You know, she's going around and seeing, she's very active in the nursing home. She's going around seeing everybody, making sure they're okay and, and, all, and everything, and and, we, and when I go see her, I usually tell her, I say, all right, make sure, remember, remember, you're that light, you know. And she tell me, I know, I'm the light. You know, I'm a light here, I'm a, I'm a light here, and I'm just, you know. We should, each and every one of us, we have opportunity to serve. And if you say, you know what, I don't have a desire anywhere to serve. Then we need to start praying and asking God to give you a desire. It could be as far as on the bus route. Like I say, it could be just for maybe the Holy Spirit convicts you about being a, like I said, being a prayer warrior. Working in some aspect of, 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 the, of the church. It doesn't matter for us, and fortunately, there's no respect of age. God doesn't matter how old we, we, we are. God could use us. Before we started that jail ministry at a church there in Missouri, I went with another church, and a guy told me the first time, he came with me, and I thought, oh, wow, I'm going, I'm going with him. Very nice guy. He said, you know what, I don't know about this, but I kept putting it off and putting it off, but I'm, I'm going to give it. I told, I told the Lord, the Lord kept convicting me. I know this is an opportunity to, to go into jail ministry. I'm going to do it. And I said, okay, you know, we're going to do it together. He was 91 years old. 
and we would go in there every time our, our, our rotation was, we would go into the jail. He did it for, we and him did it for about a year and a half before he, passed, before he eventually passed away. God's no respecter of age. And that's exciting. This is, it is, it's, it's not where, you know what, when you get to a certain age, that's it. You're done for God no more. God, you can't be used. No. God could use anybody as long as back when they were back. God says that no man looks on the outward, outward appearance. God looks on the heart. If you have a willing heart, God could use you. And whatever service, whatever ministry it may be, maybe God has spoken to you about a certain ministry. Then talk to the pastor. You can go and talk about it. You go and you see that's getting something going. But if you, if you do, don't have a desire for it right now. Pray and ask God to give you desire. You know, if you notice, the people in these stories, both of these stories, knowing these crowds, they saw the opportunity. The crowds, and they knew who Jesus was, or they wouldn't have been lined up. They wouldn't have been pressing against him, or pressing, pressing to see him. They could have made sure, you know what, Jesus, he went and he... We all hear all the stories about how Jesus heals all these blind people and he does all these miracles. Instead of hushing Bartimaeus up, they should have went and back in having him back in the back of the crowd. They should have went in there and started rushing him. Hey, come on, Bartimaeus, you go. Here comes Jesus. You need to be healed. Here, you come up. For, you come up to the front of the line. You come up to the front of the crowd. But they didn't. They kept him in the back. Zacchaeus, even though I kind of had the picture in my mind, Zacchaeus. You know, he's back there, and he's back there. Maybe he's jumping up and down trying to see over the crowd. Maybe he's getting on his, on his hands and knees trying to crawl through the legs of the people, trying to go and get to see Jesus. He couldn't, so he had to climb the tree. But what if, I mean, what if people sit there and they turn around and pe- they see people, someone back there trying to push against them, trying to see Jesus. Why didn't they sit and turn around and say, you know what, if anybody needs Jesus, you know, it's him, it's Zacchaeus. Here, let's get Zacchaeus up there to the front of the line. Let him go and let him meet Jesus. But they didn't. They had opportunities right there, but they let the opportunities pass them by. They didn't see the they didn't see the opportunities. Maybe they just they weren't aware of the opportunities. And with, you know, even not only that, in verse seven it talked about in chapter nineteen it talked about how whenever Jesus he went to Zacchaeus' house, they murmured. They were upset that he went and that he went to. They murmured that he had. So when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he has gone to be the guest with a man that is a sinner. Here's Jesus going to a sinner's house, someone's house, and the, and the crowd's upset. You know, with opportunity comes a choice. We have to get out of our comfort zone. A lot of times we have to go and, go and do something for God. We got to get out of our comfort zone. We have to. We have these things called expectations. Some are good. Some work with us. Some don't. And I had this, get my rope and scissors. You got a bag, kind of, let me, all right. All right, Miss Robin, I'm going to, I want to come down there to you, I guess. I have this rope here, and what I'm going to do, we're going to take this rope, and you're going to cut the rope. I'm going to put the rope in the bag, and, the ba- and when I'm going to take it out, I'll fold the bag back up. I open back out. When I open back out, it'll be tied. Okay? Everybody understand that? We're going to cut the rope, put the rope in the bag. It's going to come out tied. All right, now, when you cut the rope, you can cut the rope right here in the middle. That will make it very easy. You can co- cut the rope on the side. On the ends, that will make it a little bit harder, but it just kind of depends on how much of a blessing you want to be. Um, so I'm going to give you the scissors. You can pick wherever you want. I'm not going to tell you any other way. You know, hint. You cut wherever you. Okay. Thank you. You've been a little honorary this morning, a little bit. You kind of exactly in the middle. We go, we have her bag. We're going to go put the rope in there. We're going to go and fold it up. Uh, I don't know what they usually do. They kind of go and roll the hand over, their, over the, the bag, maybe say a little quick, little small little prayer. And the rope goes in the bag and it's going to come out tied. Yes, it did. Now.
Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Some of y'all's confusion, y'all thought maybe, how many of y'all thought I was talking about the rope? <laughs> this ain't America's Got Talent. This is, this is, I mean, this is me. <laughs> but see, we all, we, we expected something different. We expected, we had different expectations. We had, we, we expected that the rope to be, a, the rope to be tied, not actually a tied box. We all, if we're not careful, expectations can get in our way of serving God, unfortunately. It can go both ways. You imagine Zacchaeus, he, his expectations of being rich probably thought that he would go and he would have, get the peace that he needed, but he didn't. There's a lot of times this world goes and promises a lot of things that's going to bring us happiness. We go and we, we the world promises a lot of things, we see a lot of things, we, and it kind of appears that it's going to bring us happiness, it's going to bring us peace that we so desperately need. But the only thing that's going to go and give us the peace is, is through Jesus Christ. A lot of times our expectations can be serving God. A lot of times we go and we think, you know what, there's no way I could go and I could serve God in this way or that way because I don't think I could do it. You know what? If God gives you the desire to do something, you're not doing it on your own. You're doing it through God. And God's going to go and help you do it. God's going to help you get through it. I know I'm just thinking, just throwing it out there to VBS is coming up. I don't know how many of y'all work, like to work with kids. I mentioned it kind of before. And you think, I can't work with kids, or you know, I can't do this, or I can't do that. If we go and we go and we turn it over to God and we get out of our comfort zone, man. We'd be surprised how much of a blessing, how much joy we could go and we could get out of that. Anything we do for God is going to bring it, it, it can bring us joy if our, heart, if our heart's in it, if we're doing it. So many times we go and we think, you know what, doing something for God, coming to church, doing, living for God, that's, so, that's not the way to go. That's, that's boring. That's, we don't want to do that. That's not, it's, that's not exciting. But God says that, we, that we, anything we do through God has eternal value, and it will go, and it can, it can be exciting. We can go and so expectations. A lot of times we think we can never witness. But if we do it, we get out of our comfort zone. We can, you see how God can work through this, through it. And a lot of times it's just being in the right place at the right time. You go and you witness to somebody. They go and they say you know time after time. And the Lord's been working on their hearts. I know far as I, I think I mentioned this once, once before, the guy I used to, to work with, he, he knew that he knew that I was a Christian. He went and he came to me. Started he was new to our to our building. He came to me, started asking questions, started asking questions about God, how to get to heaven and everything. He knew I was a Christian. We would go and we would talk and we would talk. Finally one day he went and he came and said, You know what, I need to be saved. And so I said, Okay. So we went in a break room and the Bible took him took him through on the to the Bible and he got saved. We worked night shift, this was about two o'clock, two thirty in the morning. He said, You know what, I gotta go and I gotta call my mom. I'm like, it's 2.30 in the morning. She's probably asleep, you know. You sure you want her to call her? She said, no. She said, she said she, every time I get off the phone with her, because she, she lives down there in Arkansas, every time I go and she got off the phone with me, she says, I'm praying for you to get saved. I'm praying for you to get saved every time she talked to her. So every time she talked to him. So it's not anything I did. I was just there. He just knew I was a Christian. I was just there at the right, at the right time. We were both working in the same, same building. It was all those countless for the past five years, his mom constantly going and praying for her son. We got to go and get out of our comfort zone. We got to go and and be that be that light. You know, our, our world seems to be getting darker and darker in a lot of ways. And Christian, God's had this as Christians, the Christians to be that light. And we need to go and make sure we're doing what we can, what we can do to be that light, no matter what, no matter the cost. What we can do to help us seize the opportunities that, and don't let the false expectations get in our way. We need to be in tune with God. By reading his word, it's our signpost. It, it, it kind of helps direct our past. In uh, Psalms chapter 119, verses 105. Psalms 119, 19, 105. Says my, you know, get there here. Psalms 119, verse 105, it says, the, Lord, the, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. 
that's when we, we need to make sure we're going and how, how are we going to go and help with these uh, opportunities and not let them pass us by just by getting into his word. But we go and we get into God's word. We're doing our devotions, praying, reading God's word. That's going to help us be in tune. So that way, whenever we go, we have these opportunities. We're more sensitive to go and to act upon these opportunities. We used to do it, and we had the youth directors before, and we had the college class. We, I used to, I did a trick one time about part of letting God guide their path. And we took about 20, 25 mouse traps and took the springs off each and every one of them except for one. And we'd go and we'd line them out on the floor, and, we, and they would go, and we'd blindfold one of them. And I was going, and they'd be blindfolded, and I'd tell them, we're, we're going to put the mouse traps out, and I'd put them out, and I'd have one of them that I could kind of go with them, putting it out, I could kind of let it accidentally snap, make them, make them think that they're all for real. So now as I put it down, as it snapped, I'd go and I'd take the little spring off of it, and I had them all kind of, a little bit, like, kind of like a mousetrap, you know, mine, minefield. And their purpose was they had to go and they had to walk through that minefield, and we made them take the shoes off. And they had to go and walk through the minefield, walk, walk through around the, uh, the mouse traps. And I would tell them, take a step forward, maybe two steps forward, take a step to the right, take a step to the left, and try to maneuver their way through the, through the, the mouse traps. But I always had one other person go and tell them the opposite. If I say, take two steps to the right, you tell them to take it to the left. If I, they, 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 the other person would go and say the opposite of what I'm telling them. Kind of represent Satan. And or if they were going to go and walk through there safely, they would have to go and listen to my voice. And that's the same thing with God. We got, we got, and as we go through our day-to-day -day lives daily, we're going to go through and we're going to, God's going, God's going to give us directions. If we're going, we're spending time in God's word. We're sensitive to the Holy Spirit when he goes and he speaks to us. God's going to guide our path. But you got Satan out there also is going to be trying to get us to do something different, kind of goes to the opposite. So we got to focus in on God, on, on God's voice, focus in on on on, our, on the Holy Spirit. Now you got the next few few minutes. And, and Luke, actually in chapter of Luke, verse eighteen, chapter eighteen, we're going to kind of we know the story of a another Jesus encounters another rich man. And chapter Luke, as far as Luke chapter eighteen, verse eighteen, says here, and a certain ruler asked him, saying, "Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life?" And Jesus said to him, "Why callest me thou good? None is good save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments: do not commit adultery, do not, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother." And he said, "All these things have I kept from my youth up." Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto them, Yet lack, lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And he goes on, Here's a rich man. Of course, we know that riches does not get us to heaven. He was trying, Jesus was trying to show him that see how serious he was about coming to coming to Christ. This rich man, this rich man, he came. He had an opportunity. He wanted to go and, and come to Jesus. He wanted to go and see how he could have eternal life. But when it came down to the choice, he went. He was still hanging on to those riches. He wouldn't let everything go. He didn't give into God to, to Christ fully. And says so he walked away. He said, we walked away sorrowful. He had the same opportunity, the same choice as Zacchaeus and Bartimaeus, but he chose not to. We know that time is important. We also know that Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus, this was the last time they would see Jesus. If you go and you, you go read past this, past what we were reading, it goes on, Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem, and then eventually he would go, and soon he would be, he'd be arrested and, and uh, crucified and resurrected. So time was, was valuable to him. You know, in conclusion, we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing with the opportunities that God has for us? If you're here today, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. If you can say, you know what, I can honestly say, I do not know if I, if I were to die today, that I would go to heaven. Or, or if you go and you say, you know what, I don't know, I hope I go to heaven. God doesn't want you to hope, he wants you to know. And God says that we, all, that we, we could all know. There's never been a time you said to Christ as your Savior, you could go and you could come down to the altar and have someone pray with you. 
show you, told you in the Bible how you could go and ask God to forgive you of your sins. Believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. God says he'll save you. Maybe here today you say, you know what, I know I'm saved, but maybe there's some opportunities that, are, that, I, that I've been missing. I need to go and I, need, I want the Holy Spirit to, I want to go and take advantage of my opportunities better. We need to go, maybe you need to do some business with God. He will help us with when we take the opportunity. We need to persist even when others criticize us. We need to keep going for, for Jesus. We need a purpose in our heart to the people who take advantage of every God-given opportunity and make the choice to seek Jesus. So many times there's people sitting me sit on the sidelines. As Christians in today's world, with, 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 with signs of the time of the Christ, we know draw us near. We can't have Christians on the sidelines. I mean, if you were, if you were in, a, say, a, you know, a football game, and you rode the bench the whole time, you were never in the game. You know, yeah, you would enjoy some of the, the advantages of seeing, the, seeing your friends out there playing, but you never got to go and experience playing yourself, that kind of joy. As Christians, we're never on the sideline. We, I mean, we, we can, we can we, God doesn't want none of us to be on the sideline. A lot of times, Christians, we do get on the sideline. We get busy with day-to-day things. We could, get on, we could go, and we, if we're not careful, we'll stay on the sidelines and not get in the game and not be doing things for Christ. I'm going to close with a story. It was one of the world's worst train disasters occurred in the El Toro, tan, uh, El Toro, El, I don't get it right, El Toro Tunnel in Leon, Spain on January 3rd, 1944. There's a long passenger train. And as they're going through the tunnel, they were in the middle of the tunnel. The first engine stalled, and it stopped. This was one of those uh, trains that had, you know, you had the engine on either, either end with the train cars, with the passenger cars in the middle. Whenever that first train, the engine stalled, the one at the end thought, okay, it stalled. I'll, I'll start my engine up, and I will back it out. Well, by the time when he started, the, the rear engine started up the train, the first one engine got theirs going again. They didn't realize they couldn't communicate. They couldn't realize they, they didn't realize they both got their train started at the same time. So they started pulling against each, against each other. And so, and so they went and they said, "Okay, we need more power." So they kept pushing, pulling the power, trying to go and get more horsepower, trying to go and get the trains. But they were both sitting there going and pulling against each other. They're both trying to go in opposite directions. Carbon monoxide started filling up that tunnel, and by the time it was over. There was over 400 people that died on the train because of carbon monoxide poisoning due to they, they didn't know which way to go. They were, going, they were pulling in each other's directions. They weren't, and that's a lot of times as Christians, we need to make a decision which way we're going to go. If we're going to go and we're going to follow God, if we're going to go and we're going to follow Christ, then we, need, then we need to go and do it wholeheartedly. We need to go and seize the opportunities, that, the opportunities that we have because God gives us these opportunities for a purpose. God wants us to use us to fulfill his, to, to, to go and to lead others to Christ. So you, God wants to use us to go and bring others to, to him. Whether or not for even other Christians coming to being a blessing to others, God wants to use us. And if we're not careful, we can go and we can miss out on the blessings of a lifetime. But most important, if you're here today, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Seize the opportunity. Don't wait. Don't go and let it pass you by again. Take the opportunity God gives you and make the choice to accept him.